Church. My name is Enoch. That's me. And I'm here to tell you about Joseph. This is about the Joseph in the left half of your Bible, not the Joseph in the right half. We have covered two weeks of Joseph's life, and we have six more to go. Joseph's story is really a story about when life gets tough, and we go through hard things. It is very easy to get sad, mad, and we act badly. When those things happen to us, the question we get to ask ourselves is, do we respond or do we react when those hard things happen? When we trust that God has a plan for those hard things, we get to respond with faith. We aren't always responsible for those things that happen, but we are always responsible for the choices we make in those times. Have you ever felt alone? Sometimes it is easy to think you've been ignored or forgotten. It's even possible to be lonely when you are in a group of people. When I feel like I have lost Everything, like my toys, my stuff, my backpack, my cousins, my family, that makes me feel sad. The temptation is to think that God doesn't care, no one notices, and time is running out. Joseph probably felt the same way. Today, we will take a look at Joseph dealing with the feeling of being lost and alone. Take it away, Pastor Rick. That's pretty good. Enoch Matheny, everybody. So after, after first service, um, I had more than one request uh, for, for Enoch just to preach this service. And so we're going to bring him back from Kids Block, and he'll give the rest of the message today. That would probably be a lot of fun. Uh, it's not going to happen. I was, I was just kidding. But it's a great way to start the service off. Hey. Something happened to me a couple days ago. Uh, actually, it was a couple weeks ago. When you get old, ah, a couple days, a couple weeks, a couple months, it's all the same thing. I came back from a, a short trip and uh, saw a notice on my door. And I live in Ankeny, in a neighborhood in Ankeny. And, and um, it's one of those neighborhoods with a homeowner's association where you got to pay them money to tell you what to do. And, you know, it's one of those, it just it kind of irritates me the whole, I bought the house knowing I was at a homeowner's association. I got it. And, Unfortunately, I got it because um, I got a note on my door when I got back from this trip that said that, um, and it was actually from the city, that said I needed to trim my trees, that I had trees that were out of compliance to Ankeny policy, and that if I didn't trim my trees, or I don't know what they were going to do, something or else, just a dot, 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 an ellipsis at the end. So I thought maybe like you would think, I'm like, yeah, they'll probably forget about it. It was just a random note. I won't worry too much about this. My trees look fine to me, and I didn't do anything about it. I got a knock on my door, um, I don't know, about a week later. And you know, when someone knocks on your door these days, it used to be exciting, now it's not, it's kind of creepy. Someone knocks on your door, I said, Joy, someone's knocking on the door. She said, I'm not gonna get it. And I said, well, I'm not getting it either. I didn't, no one texted me and said they were coming over, so I didn't answer the door. But I looked out the window and I saw a city of Ankeny truck. And I'm like, oh my goodness, here I go, right? And the business card left there on the, on the door with a notice saying that all trees in residential areas in Ankeny are supposed to be trimmed eight feet above the sidewalk. Eight feet, that's pretty tall. Like if I raise my hands up, that's about eight feet. And that I was gonna have to trim my trees or else, dot, dot, dot. And so I did what you would do, right? At first I got mad. I'm like, good gracious, who turned me in, right? And I, and I wanted to find out who it was. I wanted justice, I wanted to, to so I walked around my neighborhood with a tape measure and I measured everybody's trees that weren't eight feet over the sidewalk. And do you know that 90% of the trees in my neighborhood weren't eight feet above the sidewalk? 90% of them, almost nobody had their trees in compliance with Ankeny. Why were they singling me out? I wanted to know. So I called the guy from the city who came to my house and we had a meeting. And he said, one of your neighbors turns you in. And I said, which neighbor? And he said it was an anonymous email. And he said to me, he said, I wish I knew how to write anonymous emails. Um, and I said, well, I know lots of people who know how to write them. But uh, he said, if I could write one, I'd probably send one. But somebody sent an anonymous email and they've turned you in and you have to trim your trees. And I said, well, do you know, I walked around this neighborhood and he said, let me stop you. 
He said, I know. He said, 90% of the people in Ankeny don't have their trees trimmed eight feet above the sidewalk. You can be that guy if you want to. You can turn everybody in in your neighborhood. Now, there are two people from our church who live in our neighborhood. And I was thinking about just turning those two in because misery loves company. The capels and the guys all of a sudden get a notice on their door. He goes, you can be that guy if you want to. Um, You can turn everybody in. But he said, then I'm going to have to go to every single house and put notices on them. I wanted to be that guy. I was like, fine. Somebody turned me in. You're not going to tell me who it is. I'm going to turn somebody else in. And I was whining about it. I was griping to my wife about it. I played the victim. Now, I didn't turn anybody else in. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to cause problems for my neighbors. I'm not even going to try to go knocking door to door to see who it was that turned me in anonymously because my trees weren't eight feet above the sidewalk. But I really wanted to. It was so easy to throw myself into victim mode, so easy to to think everyone's out to get me and what did I do to bother anybody and why do I live in this city in the first place and throw myself in into a, a tizzy. And then I realized, why be that guy? Being a victim is a real thing. But choosing to be a victim for the rest of your life, well, that's our thing. That's a choice. This morning, we're going to see Joseph making a hard choice. He's going to choose whether to be that guy, whether to be a victim, whether to lash out, even though some of the things that he did and the reason he was in the situation he was in, some of the things were his fault, even though most of it wasn't. He could choose to be that guy. He could choose to turn his back on the Lord, even though he found himself alone, abandoned, in a place he didn't want to be, with people he didn't want to be around, dealing with stuff he did not want to deal with. But instead, he chose uncommon faith. Let's start today with the passage from Romans that we've started the last two weeks of our series and we'll continue to look at for the next three weeks. The Apostle Paul writes, for everything that was written in the past, in the Old Testament, was written to teach us so that through the endurance of the people, the stories, the characters like Joseph, the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide that it'll give you and it will give me hope. In this story, we see Joseph having to make some hard choices. We have seen Joseph being born into privilege, being raised with dysfunction, being gifted things his brothers didn't get, having dreams his brothers didn't have, not having the discretion to keep his dreams to himself, sharing his dreams, living a life part, partly his fault, partly his circumstance. His dad should have known better. His brothers should have known better. They didn't. Maybe they did. But what happened, happened. Joseph found himself beaten, thrown into a well, sold to slave traders, moved to Egypt, enslaved in a person's home whose wife accused him of rape. And now he finds himself in prison. And he had to decide, was he going to put his faith in circumstances and his hope? Now, we know that if we put our faith and our hope in circumstances, that we become disillusioned. And disillusionment leads us to a crisis of faith. He had to decide, am I going to put my faith and my hope in people? And when we put our faith and our hope in people, people will let us down. And it leads us to disillusionment, which can lead us to a crisis of faith. He had to decide, just like you and I have to decide, if he was going to put his faith in himself. Because after all, who's more trustworthy than ourselves? But you've lived a life like I have, and there's water that's gone under the bridge, time has passed. If you're honest, you know yourself will let you down every time. Trusting yourself leads to disillusionment with God with life and a crisis of faith. Choosing to have uncommon faith means choosing to trust God in spite of the circumstances you find yourself in, even if you're used to being or playing a victim. The definition of victim, very simple. A person who is harmed, injured, or killed as a result of a crime, an accident, or other event or action, and it happens. It's a real thing. Many of you in here have experienced this, and I don't mean to take anything away from that. But the point of the message today is that God does not commit crimes, that he does not commit accidents. 
and that he works all of the things in your life together, the good things and the terrible things and all the things in between. He works all of those things together to bring about good. Morally, spiritually, intrinsically good. Even though it doesn't look like it. And we have to decide who we're going to trust. So right now you're going to listen to an excerpt, a narration of the scripture, of the story that we're going to cover today. And then I've asked Pastor Dan to come and share a testimony, a little snapshot of his life where he connects with Joseph in a way that maybe you can relate to, in a way that I know will encourage us and also I think really make us appreciate how faithful God is. So now just relax, listen to this entire chapter as the story of this excerpt of Joseph's life is unfolded for you. And then after Dan shares his story, I'll come back and we'll apply this truth together. Genesis 39 and 40. Once again, we pick up the story of Joseph in the midst of heartache. We find Joseph exactly where we left him last time, unjustly imprisoned. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. He reached out in kindness to him. He put him on good terms with the head jailer. The head jailer put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners. He ended up managing the whole operation. The head jailer gave Joseph free reign, never even checked on him, because God was with him. Whatever he did, God made sure it worked out for the best. As time went on, it happened that the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt crossed their master. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the head cupbearer and the head baker, and he put them in custody under the captain of the guard. It was the same jail where Joseph was held. The captain of the guard assigned Joseph to see to their needs. After they had been in custody for a while, The king's cupbearer and baker both had a dream on the same night, each dream having its own meaning. When Joseph arrived in the morning, he noticed that they were feeling low, so he asked them, What's wrong? Why the long faces? We dreamed dreams, and there's no one to interpret them. Don't interpretations come from God? Tell me the dreams. First, the head cupbearer told his dream to Joseph. In my dream, there was a vine in front of me with three branches on it. It budded, blossomed, and the clusters ripened into grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's cup. I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and gave the cup to Pharaoh. Here is the meaning. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will get you out of here and put you back to your old work. You'll be giving Pharaoh his cup, just as you used to when you were his cupbearer. Only, remember me when things are going well with you again. Tell Pharaoh about me and get me out of this place. I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and since I've been here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in this hole. When the head baker saw how well Joseph's interpretation turned up, he spoke up. My dream went like this. I saw three wicker baskets on my head. The top basket had assorted pastries from the bakery, and birds were picking at them from the basket on my head. This is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will take off your head, impale you on a post, and the birds will pick your bones clean. And sure enough, on the third day, it was Pharaoh's birthday, and he threw a feast for all his servants. He set the head cupbearer and the head baker in places of honor in the presence of all the guests. Then he restored the head cupbearer to his cupbearing post. He handed Pharaoh his cup just as before. And then he impaled the head baker on a post, following Joseph's interpretations exactly. But the head cupbearer never gave Joseph another thought. He forgot all about him. When Rick and I were riding in a car, he said, hey, I'm talking about abandonment alone and being forgotten. And if anybody knows part of my story, Pastor Rick does, and as much as he knows, I will share it. As you get older, um, it gets a little harder. You know, you get a little older, uh, you get a little more emotional. But um, what I know is perfect stories I can't connect with. Broken stories I get. And part of uh, the understanding of abandonment 
being forgotten and alone. Let me give a little background to it. You guys, some of you know me, some of you are guests, but my dad's a pastor. Rick and I both grew up sort of as pastor's kids, but I've got my dad and both uncles are pastors. We're known for ministry and family, about 150 years of ministry involvement in the Shouse family. And then, I don't know about you, but if you could define your worst nightmare, well, mine was losing my family in ministry, which is what our family was known for. So after about 18 years of doing family and ministry, we had uh, walked through some ministry that was hard. We had some leaders that made some bad decisions, some things you see and watch on TV have happened, and so it had been rough. We went back to the Quad Cities there in Davenport, Iowa, to sort of call a timeout to regroup, catch our breath, and start over. Except my wife then said, I'm done with you, and I'm done with ministry. I want a divorce. And I said to myself, can't happen. No way, no how. We're shouts. We are known for ministry. We're known for family. We impact people. It's what we do. That was my worst nightmare. Never anticipated ever happening. And on top of that, no offense, but I'm from the South, born in Mississippi, raised in Memphis, Tennessee. 115 degrees in August is great. 30 below zero is hell. We are told down south people die below zero, much less 30 below zero. So not only am I living my worst nightmare, I'm the place after 18 years. You know how you sort of say, God, please never this, like somewhere further, but not in Iowa. So I'm walking through this divorce. I find a house. It's a farmhouse in the big, massive city of Donahue, Iowa. Donahue, Iowa has two things, cows and corn, and that's about it. I'm alone, I'm isolated, I'm 500 miles away from my family, my support group, any help. And I'm looking around like we all do, regardless of the circumstance, you know, or some of you know what that feeling is like where you ask, how in the wide world is this fair? How after 18 years of helping leaders and people and equipping and preaching and teaching, how is this fair. And then look where I'm at. There's nothing. There's nobody. And I'm going to die here pretty soon because the, the cold. And I find myself in this little farmhouse trying to figure out, trying to figure out what's fair. I'm so, as you are sometimes in that season, so angry thinking, why, how, all the questions that we ask. I remember going on a conference, re-educating myself to jump back into the, the workforce after 18 years. And I come back 18 years, you've acquired a lot of stuff, beds, furniture, and we had four 15 by 20 by 20 foot tall high storage units. And I come back to everything gone, hoping and praying God might restore this marriage. This might be a really cool story, but I come back and everything's gone, but my weight equipment, my tools, and my clothes, and I realize the reality, this is happening. I went out behind the storage shed and said things to God. I was, I wasn't having a bad day. <laughs> I was starting to fall into hopelessness. And I cursed God and I expected and wanted to die. If I had done something in your grand scheme of fair, I'm a big boy, you can take it on me, but I have, I have two boys that are innocent. They don't deserve this. They've done nothing wrong. And anger leads to frustration, leads to bitterness, and I just decided to write God off, thinking, as a pastor's kid, doing this for 18 years, maybe this isn't even true. Maybe this is a lie. Maybe this is brainwashing. Maybe at best this is theistic evolution. God created us and said, good luck, hope it works out. And I thought maybe that's what's true. I remember wrestling in the home alone in this house, trying to figure things out, trying to figure out the job situation, trying to just literally survive. And these whispers, these lies of whispers, starting getting louder in my head. So loud that I started believing them as truth. Again, not a bad day. I started losing all hope, being abandoned, isolated, alone. A gun beside me 
Never in my life have I battled this except for that season where I said, this is what it's like. I can't take this loss. I can't take this pressure. I can't take a dad trying to be a superhero to his boys. They're, it's not going to work out. They're going to be scarred for life. And those lies were whispers that became screams. And then the circumstances, I started looking at reality thinking there's no way. I'm literally in my late 30s, about to turn 40. Time is running out. There is no hope. You're the only shells that's ever been divorced. You are a complete loser. But you know, the stories, when we think God has forgotten us, that he's abandoned us, um, they can change in a moment. The problem is we don't know when, right? The timing, when is God going to step in? Is he going to step in? And I'll never forget the time where I felt all those abandonment, alone in isolation. All of a sudden, the ex-family, right, the guys that everybody tells you stay away from because blood is thicker than water, separate yourself, started to become family. They saw what was going on. I have... The ex-sister-in-law and ex-brother-in-law say, hey, listen, we see what's going on. We're going to buy you and the boys a house. Who does that? Fix a meal, send a card, but who buys a house? Started thinking, maybe, maybe, God, I'm mad, I'm ticked. Maybe this is part of your plan. And then things started happening more and more. I didn't want to give God total credit, but you couldn't not see it. So I'm sort of like, you know, doing this. I'm like, I can't see, but I can't deny that you're doing something. I have a job. I, on paper, I have no reason to have. I get this job at a medical company. The new general manager is a believer, a former VP of a multi-billion dollar company, and becomes a dear friend, a mentor. Earlier in his life, had been through a divorce and walked me through it. Again, I'm thinking, what are the odds? I get a call from my first cousin. Again, we're all shallows. We're, we're tight. And she and her family are in St. Joe, Missouri. Say, hey, come with the boys and let, let us love on you guys. Just feed you and love on you. So we go over there and we hang out. And What are the odds that my first cousin's best friend leading the student group happens to be a, a lady named Lori, who is my wife of 10 years now, and everything changed. See, what I thought was a period in the story, the whispers of the lies became screens. Circumstances I thought were reality were all a farce. It's everything that we have preached for now 30 years is 100% true. God was writing a story. It was just a comma. It was not a period. And what I know is until God stops our heart and stops our breath, we have a purpose. And as much as none of us want to go through this chapter, guys, it's the only way that sort of reality connects, you know? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 remind us, trust in the Lord with most of your heart. No, it doesn't say that. But that's sort of how I lived it for a while. I didn't want to give him all of my heart because I felt like he betrayed me, but God was just saying, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Every day, just hold on. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding because you'll be a, in a straitjacket. I promise you, you try to figure it out. It doesn't make sense. In all your ways, you acknowledge him, you submit to him. And he absolutely will direct our paths and make them straight. Thank you, Dan. You know, thinking about the words that Paul wrote, that the Holy Spirit gave him, about how these things in the past were written so that we can have hope and encouragement. It's not just scripture, although that's what Paul was talking about. It's the lives of the people who we know, who have gone through things and have experienced the reality that sometimes life is really unfair and really hard, but that God is writing a story that's far greater than we can imagine. I was thinking about that this week. I have two uncles who uh, both reached out to me this week and they watch online and they're, um, you know, my dad's age, which is older than me. And thinking about my dad and my two uncles and the way they've lived their lives. And I know who they are now as they're in their 70s or at least thereabouts. 
But the reason that I know who they are is because I've watched them go through the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs, the times when it seemed like everything was going great and the times when it seemed like everything was falling apart and know that they didn't quit, that they hung on with an uncommon faith even though we're just common people. My friend, Dan, a common person just like me, no super ordinary, extraordinary faith or ability. I promise you that his feet touch the ground when he walks and his Bible doesn't hover over the desk when he has his daily devotions. But he has an uncommon faith. And he's been through times where it looks like God had abandoned him, as have I and as have you. And Joseph found himself in a time where not only did it look like God had abandoned him, but anybody paying close attention would say God has abandoned you. And the temptation would be to give up. But Joseph did not. And he lives out the reality that his story wasn't over, just like yours is not over yet. So whether you are going through disillusionment and you're feeling alone because of family tension, because of health or life circumstances, because of the attacks of another person, because of the conflicts that are going on within yourself, you can relate to this story. You can endure and God can and will develop in us uncommon faith. So let's look at this together very quickly. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him because God was with Joseph. Joseph was with God. Because Joseph was with God, God was with Joseph. He chose to look and light a candle instead of curse the darkness, even though the darkness was crowding in around him in a way that would have made it hard to deal with. Joseph didn't like his location. He didn't like his vocation. And I'm sure that there were times when he kind of looked up and he wondered if he really even liked God. But he hung on. If you look at the chronology of his life, as we already have talked about. He went through tremendous highs and tremendous lows and then false highs and then big time lows and looked like things were gonna get better only to see things get worse. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him and God showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now you may say, who cares? That's what I would say because he doesn't wanna be in prison. And God gave him favor in the eyes of the prison warden, and he gave him a certain responsibility within the prison that allowed him to do something that he otherwise would have not been able to do. Now let's continue to look at the story. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all of those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt defended their master. He was angry with them. And he put them into custody in the house of the captain of the guard, the same prison where Joseph was. Now, here's where the story gets a little bit, um, well, the plot turns. The cup bearer, who was the right-hand man of the king, a best friend of the king, somebody who had to taste everything that went into the king's mouth because many times assassinations were attempted or done through poisoning. And so the cup bearer was the one who stood between the potential assassin and the king himself who would taste the food and drink the drink and oftentimes was a confidant of the king like Nehemiah was, if you know your Bible or have been around church for any period of time. And then the baker who made the food that went into Pharaoh's mouth, they had made Pharaoh mad for some reason. Who knows if they made a bad dinner, if they gave him bad advice threw them into prison and they had a dream. Now, do you know the phrase trigger warning? Are you tracking with me? You see this sometimes, you see trigger warning like on TV or you know if you're on Facebook or something. And what this literally means is that, it, that whatever you're going to see or experience or hear could remind you of some trauma and bring up memories or things or feelings that are gonna take you back to a situation you don't wanna be in, so be careful, there's a trigger warning. It's a real thing. Here's a big time trigger warning because you have Joseph and you have two people who had two dreams. Now, do you remember how Joseph got into trouble in the first place? With dreams. He dreamed dreams and he told his brothers about it and his brothers beat him up for it and wanted to leave him for dead. The cupbearer had a dream. He had a dream about some grapes and some fruit and he made it into wine and gave it to Pharaoh and there were three of them and Joseph said, yes, I'll interpret the dream. The baker had a dream with three baskets of bread, birds eating out of one of the baskets. He had a dream and he wanted Joseph to interpret the dream. 
Let's look at the scriptures here, and I'll just kind of explain it as we go. Each of the men, they had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. And Joseph asked him, why do you look so sad? Now, I would have said, because I'm in prison, but they said, we both had dreams. They answered, but there's no one to interpret them. And then Joseph said to them, do not the interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So they told him, Joseph interpreted the dreams with good news and with bad news. The cupbearer's dream was interpreted in a way that was pretty good. He said, in three days, Pharaoh's gonna invite you back to dinner. He's gonna lift up your head and he's going to respond in a way that will reinstate you. You'll be his best friend again. You'll be the cupbearer. Things are good. The baker also wanted an interpretation because the cupbearer's interpretation was good and the baker's interpretation wasn't so good. Joseph said, in three days, Pharaoh's gonna lift up your head He's gonna cut your head off and he's going to basically impale you and birds are gonna eat your body. Now, Joseph didn't tell them what they wanted to hear. He didn't candy coat the truth. He told them exactly what God had told him to tell them. Good news and bad news. And then he asked them, don't forget me when you go to Pharaoh. I'm at a place I don't wanna be. And he didn't probably say this, but he thought this, around people I don't wanna be with. Criminals, I'm not even a criminal. I don't deserve to be here. Don't forget me. Don't abandon me. Remember me. Let's look on. Now, the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all of his officials. He, in fact, lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup in Pharaoh's hand, reinstated him. But he impaled the chief baker. I don't know what the baker had done. Must have been worse than the cupbearer. Just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation, the chief cupbearer, the one who got his job back, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Now, Joseph had to decide if his faith was in circumstance, if his faith was in people, if his faith was in himself, or his faith if it was in God because he was in fact abandoned. And the people who could have helped him chose not to help him. He was at a spot in life, a defining moment. Am I going to be a victim or am I going to develop uncommon faith? Am I going to look at the darkness as real as the darkness is and curse the darkness or am I going to light a candle? and be a light. And the Bible says the Lord was with Joseph because Joseph chose to walk with God. And I've prayed all week this week that as I share this story with you, that even though it's impossible for me to know what's going on in your own lives, in your own minds, in your relationships, with your finances, with your jobs, with your family, in your bodies. That all of us, from time to time, we wonder, God, are you really paying attention? God, it doesn't seem like anybody else cares. It looks like, and this is the worst lie of them all, time's running out. But these things were written in the past to encourage us and to give us hope that God is real, that he keeps his promises, that he has a plan for our lives, and that he will not quit. So let me challenge you and tell you what it is that we can do with this. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream, and Joseph's life turned. But for two full years, he stayed in prison, alone, forgotten, and abandoned. A person who simply chooses to react as a victim They say, I've really been harmed. I've really been injured. This was a result of a crime or an accident. Curse God. I'm going to turn my back on him. He's failed me. All is lost. But a person who wants to develop uncommon faith, they choose to respond in a way that's supernatural. And it's the way that I want for you and I to respond in our deepest and darkest times, our moments of need. And this challenge that I'm getting ready to give you, this prayer that I've written, comes straight from a passage of Scripture that Pastor Dan quoted just a minute ago, and it's one of my favorites, one of my life verses. 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your path straight. When you look back at your life, you probably don't see a straight path, do you? I mean, our paths, they look like this. There's highs, there's lows, there's zigs, there's zags, there's lefts, there's rights. But if we let him, the connecting theme is that God's hand, he's at work. That he is paying attention. The time is not up. That your life isn't over. And that there's a next coming. And unless we choose to trust God, we could miss the next. So this is the challenge of uncommon faith that I want to give you. And this prayer that I'm going to read to you is in your notes, on your app. It's my challenge to you because it's my challenge to me. And I promise you that our pastors here on staff, we're just people just exactly like you. We're trying to figure this out and get it right. Maybe we've had a little more time to practice, but this stuff is so hard. But this is what it looks like for common people like you and me to develop uncommon faith, to be able to pray a prayer like this and to mean it with all of our hearts. So here it is. I'm gonna leave it with you. It's your choice to decide what to do. Now, I wanna tell you that next week we're turning a corner and Joseph's life is gonna start to turn up. He's going to have opportunity. He's gonna have promotion. He's going to have the chance to avenge. But don't miss this moment because these last three stepping stones, these are what allowed God to give Joseph his next and for him to be able to discover his purpose. I know how challenging this is. I do not give this to you lightly. I do it because I love you. And I don't know any other or better way. Here's how a person of faith responds. God, I believe you're in control of my life. And that you are with me. I wish I could believe that for you. Do you really believe it? This is the kind of belief that goes beyond feeling or experience. It's the belief that comes from deciding that this is who I am and this is what God says. I believe you're in control of my life, God, even though it doesn't look like it. And that you're with me. If you have things pretty well lined up, there's a gentle breeze at your back and a warm sun on your face, life seems pretty good, God's with you. If you're in a mess and your life seems like a tangled web and you have no clue how to even begin to put things back together, if you allow him, God will be with you. If you choose to walk with God, he will walk with you. And you can say this with confidence, God, I believe you're in control of my life and that you are with me. But I'm struggling, God. And as I shared with you last week, these are the kinds of prayers that I think that God leans into. He's like, all right, now we're getting down to business. He leans in and gives us his ear. Now you're telling me the truth. Now we're communicating on a higher level. Now we've gotten past the King James English. The these, the thou, the thuses, and the therefores are gone, and you're being real with me. What do you want from your kids? That's what God wants from us. But God, I'm struggling. I know you're in control. I don't like things. What things? Pick your thing. Here are some suggestions. I'm not where I want to be. God, 
I don't feel the way I want to feel. God, I don't have what I want to have. God, I'm not with who I want to be with. I'm not even doing what I want to be doing, God. But I believe you're in control of my life and that you're with me. But here's the reality. I'm struggling. And that opens the door to something, friends. It opens the door to your next. Because this, in fact, is what comes next. Straight from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. God, change my circumstances, please. Sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. And sometimes he does in a while. And sometimes the while can seem like forever. But it's okay to ask. God, change my circumstances. Or change my heart. Make me want the things you want. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. A person of uncommon faith can say this. Change my circumstances, God, or change my heart. Make me want the things that you want. And here comes the power. But if you don't, I won't abandon you because I am becoming a person of uncommon faith. Like Abraham, like Moses, like Joshua, like Joseph, like my Uncle David, my Uncle Ray, Pastor Dan. Not perfect people, common people with an uncommon faith. You can't get to what's next until we deal with what's first. And so far in Joseph's life, we've seen forgiveness, manning up or womaning up, and dealing with temptation. And then finally, being willing to embrace the disappointment and aloneness that sometimes accompanies life without giving up on God. And just like next week, we see the next in Joseph's life, you'll see the next in yours too. We're gonna do it together. Father, thank you for my friends.